We're going to hear Senate Bill 849. Senator, when you're ready, you may begin. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee for the record. Senator Just Brown representing Senate uh, District 16. Today I'm here to present Senate Bill 849. Senate Bill 849 authorizes three tax credits to qualified employers and qualified workers for all tax years beginning on or after January 1, 2025. The first tax credit allows a qualified employer who reimburses tuition to a qualified worker who received a degree or certificate within one year prior to or following employment with the employer. The tax credit shall be equal to 50% of the amount of tuition reimbursed and claimed for the first four years of employment. The second tax credit allows a qualified employer who pays compensation to a qualified employee. That's a lot of qualifiers. Uh, for the first five years, the tax credit shall be equal to 10% of compensation paid to a qualified worker and shall not exceed 15000 for a qualified worker in a tax year total, not to exceed 75000 for any given qualified worker. <laughs> <clears throat> a third tax credit is, uh, is allowed to a taxpayer who becomes a qualified employee in the amount equal to $5,000 and may be claimed for five consecutive uh, tax with a minimum $25,000 in tax credits. Missouri S&T's College of Engineering and Computing is home to more than 4,200 undergraduate students, 750 graduate students on campus, plus 500 qualified students online. The bill will incentivize the right type of economic activity by encouraging engineers to stay in Missouri and to relo relocate to Missouri. Uh, this act shall sunset on December 31st, 2030. I believe there are some experts that are qualified uh, in the room uh, behind me, and they're happy. I'll be happy to answer any questions to the best of my qualified ability. Are, are there any questions from the committee? Yes, Senator Moon. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Senator. Uh, you you might have answered the question partially in your last statement about the need for the tax credit. Can you go into more detail about you know uh, how we're lacking in numbers and how this might uh, the expectation of attracting more and keeping more. Well, I'll use S I'll use S and T as an example. Uh, with the three hundred million dollar private donation they got uh, back in 2020, 2021, um, they're they're building a protoplex. They call it, and it's basically uh, uh, it it's going to be a, a research and development uh, building full of engineers. Um, and that will be doing research for anywhere from Boeing, Garmin, you name it. I mean, it could be anything. And uh, one of the problems is that we have is retaining our engineers uh, in the state, uh, you know, because they, they move on to companies like Boeing or somewhere like that. So this will give, and I'm using the university as an example, but uh, you could imagine with an investment like that in a town the size of Raw, I mean, by the time it's all said and done, they're going to spend $600 million on this thing. And... Uh, uh, an investment like that in a, in, the, in a town like Raleigh, you could imagine like the chattel businesses that will be associated with that, you know, whatever that looks like in manufacturing. So <clears throat> this will be a good incentive to to uh, uh, bring those businesses to a place like Raleigh or wherever, you know, there's a, there's a need for some of these engineering companies. And, and is there a cost to the state? And if so, what might that cost be? The what now? Is, is there a cost to the state? Uh, to enact this, what would the amount of the tax credits be? Do you suppose? Uh, that what would we? Do? I don't. I have the bill here. I can tell you what the fiscal note is. <clears throat> when it's fully implemented, um, the 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 total. Uh, if if it was fully implemented and maxed out, it'd be fifty five million six hundred ten thousand uh, dollars. It'll start out at twenty, just a little over twenty six million so for fiscal year twenty five, and uh, it would sunset in twenty thirty. So if it was fully implemented, uh, it would be a little under sixty million. So you say the the cost for for the uh, I think the I think the revenue that would be generated from taxes on these businesses. That, I mean, this is nothing compared to what that'll yeah. be. Okay, so so you say that the cost to the business will be about sixty million. They'll recoup about sixty million. Yeah. Okay. If it's fully implemented, you know, that's one thing that we do have um, issues with in this state when it comes to economic development is people even taking advantage of those tax credits because there may be some of those companies that just don't want to deal with the red tape that it 
takes to get one, you know. Any <clears throat> other questions from the committee? Seeing none, uh, we'll take the first witness in support. Make sure you fill out a, introduce yourself and fill out a witness form. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Morgan Mundell. I'm with the American Council of Engineering Companies of Missouri to go on record in uh, support of Senate Bill 849. Um, I'm not going to prov provide any more testimony. I brought two of my members, and for the pleasure of the committee, I've asked them to keep their testimony brief. So first one would be Mr. Bob Gilbert. Um, Mr. Gilbert is the Chief Operating Officer of Hartwood and West. Yeah. <laughs> Introduce yourself and fill out a witness form, please. Thank you. I, I will. Good morning, Madam Chair and uh, fellow members of the committee. Again, my name is Bob Gilbert. I'm the Chief Operations Officer for Bartlett & West, uh, Inc. Uh, we are a business of about 450 professionals across seven states. Uh, I'm uh, here in Jefferson City, uh, and uh, we also have offices in the state in Rolla, Springfield, St. Louis, and the Kansas City area. Uh, our profession is basically in the area of civil engineering uh, infrastructure, so water, wastewater, stormwater, transportation, uh, bridges, rail, and renewable energy are, are some of the markets that we serve. Uh, I'm here to support Senate Bill 849, uh, as this legislation will help provide engineering companies in the state uh, with additional tools to help in recruiting and training engineers to meet the demands of Missouri's economy. Uh, a little bit on the stats that Senator Moon was asking about. The U.S. Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics has projected a need for about 25,000 new engineers each year throughout the decade. This is simply to replace the individuals who retire and move out of the workforce. We add to that the recent passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act federally, uh, otherwise known as IIJA or BIL sometimes referred to. The 2021 passage of this leg legislation created the demand for an additional 82,000 engineering jobs, according to a study by Rockport Analytics. Uh, this isn't even mentioning some of the historic uh, investments being made by the state itself in Missouri, so uh, the demand is great. Uh, I'm here just to again, testify a little bit to that. Uh, the demand, uh, again, is, is uh, created an incredibly competitive environment for hiring new staff. Uh, without the ability to hire more staff and perform the engineering services that the Missouri economy currently demands. Uh, Missouri-based companies struggle to grow. Uh, our company and those we frequently partner with in Missouri are strategizing our go, no-go decisions on projects based on staffing levels rather than on our capabilities or whether uh, we, we base those on our qualifications to do the work. For instance, uh, in our company, we have, again, I said about 450 professionals across seven states. We have 100 of those in Missouri. Uh, we've had between 40 and 50 open positions for over 12 consecutive months. Uh, so you can see it's roughly 10% of our workforce uh, is who we're seeking uh, consistently and constantly. Uh, obviously, if we can grow that and could grow the company to uh, compete for bigger projects, that growth rate could even uh, surpass that. A uh, little stat, we, we are attending about 30 career fairs annually at this point in five states. Again, I think that's pretty outstanding con considering the size of our company. We're not a huge company, 450 people. So uh, we are searching everywhere. We want to grow, have the, uh, the ability to grow with workload out there, uh, but we obviously have to substantially continue to invest in recruiting and adopting strategies. One of those right now is we are hiring talent in any state that we can find them in and making remote work possible. We'd love for that growth to be in Missouri uh, and bills like this, uh, Senate Bill 849, uh, can help to attract the talent we need to deliver the projects for our citizens. So I will end thank there you. and say thank you for the... Any uh, questions from the committee? Seeing none. Next witness. Darren Hannon with Olson Engineering. Okay. Please fill out a witness form. Okay. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the, the committee. My name is Darren Hennon. I'm a vice president with Olson, uh, which is a 2,000 member full service engineering company with offices in Kansas City, St. Louis, Springfield, and Joplin. 
Olson is a proud member of Missouri ACEC, for which I offer this testimony in support of Bill 849. Missouri has a rich history of engineering from our headquartered company in Kansas City to our vibrant aerospace firms in St. Louis. Nestled in among our metro areas are numerous small to medium-sized firms working in your respective districts to provide the basic infrastructure to our communities to keep our communities vibrant. The basics of life, including water, wastewater, and electricity, are provided by these firms. In addition to life essentials, engineers provide the roads and airports necessary to move our goods, people, and services, not only across Missouri, but across the entire U.S. Missouri has come a long way in supporting STEM education in our public school system. In fact, our Olson Kansas City office is hosting five high school students for a full spring semester internship through the Northland CAPS program. One of the true benefits of Senate Bill 849 is that it incentivizes those students that advance to engineering degrees to remain in Missouri and contribute to the overall economy, while at the same time it serves as a recruiting tool for hiring in-demand talent from outside states. When Missouri works to incentivize jobs and hire within a specific sector, it is fair to ask what the value proposition is to the taxpayers of Missouri. Olson currently has almost 270 ba Missouri-based employees, but more strikingly is that we have nearly 50 openings just in our Missouri offices. Our average salary is over 85,000 people, and we anticipate hiring another 1,000 people firm-wide by the year 2030, and we'll make those hires where we can find the talent. By providing additional financial tools, our company can continue to recruit top talent into our, into our great state. Our corporate investment is reflected in an increased economic activity within our local communities and our state. The benefits of Senate Bill 849 are needed and appropriate as we continue to invest in the people and infrastructure vital to our economy. Again, I stand in support of eight bill, Senate Bill 849 and happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the committee? Senator Moon. Good morning. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, without the tax credit, I, I hear um, the, the need. Um, is the business going to is a, is the business going to suffer primarily, or are you thinking that the um, those who are needing the projects completed going to suffer if I, if this tax credit is not implemented? Yeah, the the answer would be both. Uh, we, we won't have the ability to perform the work. I think you're seeing a little bit of that with the infrastructure bills that are coming down from the federal government. There's a large amount of infrastructure funding. We can't meet the need. The community can't quite get to there, the engineering community. Uh, so the projects are going to suffer. Delay costs money, um, both in design fees and cost of materials and labor costs that go up. The second part of that is the companies won't be able to continue to, to flourish. I mean, our goal ultimately is to be a good engineering company and a good corporate citizen, but at the same time, it's to be a for-profit company and, and add back to the economy and the communities and states of which we work. So the answer would be both. And I understand that most businesses uh, in nearly every sector is uh, looking for work and having uh, problems getting those employees. And I know you're looking to attract on the front end <clears throat> And, and I'm just wondering, um, are you attracting now without the tax credit? We're, we are, as best we can. As I, you know, as I think in my testimony I provided, we have over 50 openings just in the Missouri side. Our goal is to grow 1,000. So our plan is actually, as, as I alluded to, we're going all the way back to the high school systems. We're tr starting to grow these students to engage them as early as we can in STEM-based programs. And the STEM program I alluded to is actually a semester-long internship for high school students. We take those students, last year out of, uh, we had 18, roughly 18 interns in, our, in the offices that I'm responsible for. Five of those were returning from our high school program, coming back into the program as paid college students. So we're doing, I think the industry is trying to be as innovative as we can. The traditional methods of, you know, just going to career fairs and job postings uh, are still tried and true, and we're still doing that. But the supply is outstripping, or the demand is outstripping the supply right now. And STEM education is, is coming into the forefront, but we still have a ways to go with that. And then another question with regard to once you, you get uh, a qualified um, student or employee in the system, 
what keeps them in Missouri? Uh, I, know, I know that pay is a big thing. Uh, what, what are you going to do to keep those who are attracted to the program here in the state? You know, in, and I'll speak a little bit on Kansas City and then across maybe our footprint as well. A lot of people typically in, in our situation, we're more of a civil-based company. That may be different for the aerospace where they're recruiting nationwide. A lot of the, the individuals that we're recruiting are typically wanting to stay within a, a certain region of which they either went to school or which they, they have family or home ties. Uh, Kansas City has, a, has an abundance of headquartered-based companies, which creates a, an influx, but it also creates a, a hyper-competitive uh, nature. But a lot of those are coming from other parts of the state, which this bill incentivizes. We get those students to start looking at the state of Missouri. So with those opportunities in Kansas City with those headquartered companies, our presence there, uh, Bartlett West presence across the state, you have I know you're going to receive some testimony from our aerospace partners. Those are all kind of creating an engineering vacuum that brings that talent here. Once we get them here, um, we're pretty successful in retaining them. And, the, you know, it's our quality of life, it's our tax structure, it's our affordability, and the ability to work on pretty unique jobs, not only here in the Midwest, but as the economies change and we're, our ability to work uh, remotely the ability to take on massive jobs across the United States. We do jobs out of Missouri. We, we touch all 48 states. And I say not all 50. We do 48, and, and our exception is not Hawaii and Alaska. And so the ability to do that technology has allowed us to do that. So you can come here and have those challenges and do pretty robust things, and that's been our, our calling card. Absolutely. Any other questions? Seeing none, next witness in support. Where's the, uh, where's the committee names? I will. Okay. Uh, we're going to pause here for a second. Uh, we're going to call Roe. Ashley, call the Roe. Senator Brown. Here. Senator Moon. Here. Senator Gannon. Here. Senator Koenig. Here. Senator McCreary. Senator Razor. Senator Shore. Okay. We have a quorum. You may begin. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, good morning. Uh, my name is Randall Gelzer. I'm the Director of Government Operations for the Boeing Company in St. Louis. Uh, I am here to uh, show support for Senate Bill 849. Um, just wanted to thank you for your consideration of this bill today. Um, as you've heard in the previous testimony already, uh, there's a significant need in the state for recruiting engineers. Um, and uh, Boeing Company today in the, in the state, we have over 16,000 employees of about 350 suppliers in the state spending over 768 million. Uh, they are having the same uh, concerns uh, about recruiting engineers. I have with me um, uh, two letters of support, uh, one for supplier in St. Charles and one for Kansas City that I'll also uh, offer in support of the bill. Uh, they wish they could have been here but could not. Um, but as you've heard, uh, this legislation will help uh, the state become more uh, competitive by enticing uh, businesses' ability to hire and recruit engineers across the board. Um, and this is all engineering, um, whether it's aerospace, mechanical engineering, uh, computer uh, software engineering. Um, this, uh, this bill that's being considered, uh, this is the type of tax policy that incentivizes the right type of economic activity uh, to encourage engineers to stay in Missouri and also be, allow us to be able to recruit engineers to Missouri, uh, which are uh, require significant skill base and then are also well-paying jobs. Um, for us, uh, yes, we're a manufacturing company, and yes, we're the largest manufacturer in the state, but we're also a technology company. Of our employees, about 50% are coded as engineers in some form, so we have a heavy reliance on engineering talent. Um, and as you may have heard, uh, we have started, uh, we've begun work on a $1.8 billion expansion uh, just north of, of Lambert Airport, um, we'll be adding about 500. Uh, we'll be adding 500 new jobs as part of that expansion, um, and those jobs also uh, will be in the classification of about 50% engineering roles uh, for the future. So, as you consider this, uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, we do believe uh, that this is a great tool that, for the state as we move forward and uh, supporting engineering needs across all industries, not just aerospace. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the witness? Seeing none, uh, next was witness in support.
Madam Chair, members of the committee, Ray McCarty, Associated Industries in Missouri, want to go on record in support of this bill. This is something that is a problem for all of our companies when we're trying to attract new economic development projects. One of the very first things you have to do is find workforce. And engineering being a high skilled trade, it's very difficult. So we're hoping that this bill will help provide the incentives that we need to be able to keep and grow our own engineers. Any Happy questions day. from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you. Uh, next in support. Good afternoon. Kara Quartz is on behalf of the Missouri Chamber of Commerce and Industry, also in support. And yes, we do have a workforce shortage across all areas, but we know we absolutely have a very acute need for engineers in our state's workforce. So we have gone through the data and found that the total active number of engineering online job postings for Missouri companies in December was 2,080. In the month of December alone, that's the most recently available data, there were 860 new jobs added, specifically um, for engineering posi positions. With the expansion of I-70, and I think a really other important point that needs to be brought up, our state's push also to reshore semiconductor manufacturing, to reshore critical minerals, which is the downstream supply chain for semiconductors, where the U.S. has been too overly reliant on nations who are subject to extreme geopolitical conflicts. We are going to need engineers to fill those jobs, and those jobs greatly contribute to national security as well. Um, we also know that in Missouri, our current engineering workforce is at risk of aging out. Over 26% of our state's current engineers are over the age of 55. So if you look at that, com compiled with the new need, uh, new demand for engineers, we are looking at a pretty significant um, demand. And on online profile data that we were able to compile, um, we found that 40% of engineering students who are getting their degree in Missouri are leaving the state for jobs in other states. So that's pretty significant. We want to do everything we can to attract and retain the students who are getting educated right here in our great institutions. Uh, so we believe this bill is another important piece of the puzzle for Missouri to fulfill the current and projected high demand for engineering positions. So with that, I'm happy to take any okay, questions. Any questions? You may have. Seeing none. Uh, next in support. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Mark Rhodes. I appear on behalf of the Missouri Society of Professional Engineers. And uh, you've heard a lot of testimony. I'd just like to go on record in support. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness in support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the committee, Sam Panitary, registered lobbyist on behalf of Burns & McDonald. Uh, engineering firm headquartered in Kansas City. We have offices in St. Louis and around the world. Um, 4,000 employees here in Missouri, 10,000 around the world. Uh, big fan and supporter of anything that incentivizes uh, uh, attracting and retaining engineers here. So appreciate the sponsor bringing this forward. Any questions? Saying none. Next in support. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, David Jackson, registered lobbyist for Greater St. Louis, Inc., which is the uh, unified voice for the business community in St. Louis. I uh, appreciate Senator Brown bringing this forward and want to go on record and support. Thank you. Uh, next in support. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Nancy Giddens, representing the Raider Kansas City Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to join my chamber friends and urge your support for this bill as well. Thank you. Next in support. Thank you. One more time, next in support. See, okay, let's go with opposition. Anybody here to testify in opposition? Seeing none, for informational purposes only. Senator, do you have some final comments? Nope. Okay. And, uh, thanks for all the witnesses. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Senator Trent, whenever you're ready. What bill, what's the bill number? All right, we got a couple more bills. This is Senate Bill 895, Senator Trent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Curtis Trent representing District 20. Uh, so this is a bill that uh, made it all the way to the finish line last year and just didn't quite get over the finish line. Uh, it is the moratorium on eviction proceedings, um, essentially that no uh, county, municipality, or other political subdivision shall impose. Uh, a moratorium on eviction proceedings unless specifically authorized by law. Uh, this is a, essentially like a basic property rights issue. Uh, a uh, landlord should not be forced uh, to uh, retain tenants uh, without compensation, you know, against their will. Uh, it, uh, it, it, if moratoriums are allowed to continue to exist as they do right now, it will uh, drive up the costs of uh, of um, apartments uh, and uh, and other residencies in the state uh, where those uh, kind of actions are are liable to take place, uh, and uh, and it's also uh, frankly unnecessary because there is a separate provision in law under the governor's emergency power where uh, you know housing needs can be provided on a temporary basis. Uh, but when that occurs under the governor's authority, uh, it comes with reimbursement for the landowner, uh, for the uh, for the landlord, which I believe is equitable. Uh, if the state is going to engage in a taking uh, by uh, you know housing people for an emergency purpose, uh, then there should be compensation for that. Um, in addition to uh, this provision. I have also included in this bill a, a provision that was uh, included last year uh, from, I believe, Senator Washington uh, that um, uh, provides that transfers of title of real property for rental properties with outstanding collection judgments uh, have to be filed in the circuit court within 30 days after transfer. Uh, as I recall, the reason for this provision uh, was to allow individuals who are in arrears uh, on their on their um, payment uh, of their uh, to uh, uh, rental payments to find who they should pay if the property has been transferred. So they owed money to owner A. He sold the property to owner B. Owner B is now entitled to collect the the uh, or the uh, the original owner is entitled to collect, but they no longer are able to locate them in some cases, and therefore no longer able to settle their outstanding debt. This would allow them to continue to be able to locate uh, an, an individual that they uh, want to settle a debt with. And so, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you, Senator. I think this is a good bill, and appreciate you presenting it. Any questions from the committee? All right, seeing none. Uh, witnesses in favor of testifying, please come forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jason Zankis. I'm a registered lobbyist appearing on behalf of the Missouri Association of Realtors. Uh, we'd just like to go on record in support. Um, again, we're not trying to uh, forever uh, bar the state from uh, addressing natural disasters in, in, in states of emergency. Uh, we just believe that eviction moratoriums present a real risk of infringing upon constitutionally protected uh, property rights, and that kind of determination should be made at the highest levels of government, not piecemeal from one local government to another. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Senator Mann? I, I just thought of a question, maybe for the bill sponsor. If, if that scenario you, uh, you stated uh, is realized, is the money escrowed? or they just, the, the person who owes the money, they just keep it until they find the proper recipient? Oh, you're talking about not the moratorium provision, but the... Yes. yes. So if the scenario that I described occurred and this bill has passed, then they would be able to settle their debt. As it exists right now, they, they could be unable to locate. So, I mean, I, I guess they could keep the money in escrow, but it wouldn't really do them any good at that point because they still can't find the person to settle the debt. They're still taking the hit to their credit score and, and all those attendant problems. Further questions? Seeing none, thank you. Are there any other witnesses testifying in favor of the bill? Chairman, members of the committee, Sam Wiles, 
registered lobbyist for the Missouri Apartment Association. Just want to go on record in support. Thank you. Any questions for the witness? Seeing none, are there any other witnesses testify in favor of? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Angie Schulte, um, registered lobbyist for the St. Louis Apartment Association, and we also just want to go on record in support of the bill and thank the sponsor for bringing it. Thank you. Are there any questions for the witness? Seeing none, are there any other witnesses testify in favor of? Please step forward. Any witnesses testify in opposition? Good afternoon, uh, Chairman. here today on behalf of Empower Missouri um, and just want to reiterate that we are against uh, removing local control for eviction moratoria. In particular, if we look back um, from 2021 to the beginning of 23, 86,000 Missouri households were saved from eviction through the eviction moratoria. With the emergency rental assistance that was in place through the federal government, that resulted in $644 million in rental payments to landlords. So while we understand that this is a small business issue, this is also an issue for our lowest income Missourians. And we just want to make sure that that remains a concern as well. Happy to answer any questions. I have a question. So you said 86,000 people? Yes, basically we're safe from eviction but those land those so that means 86,000 bank payments still had to be made too correct if they owed money on them so that was 86,000 households not individuals um, mm -hmm. so most likely quite a few more um, individuals were impacted and yes um, we went through six because the bank doesn't care about that they want their money I totally understand that. Mm -hmm. um, I just think this is a yes and rather than an either or issue, and that in addressing one we, one side of it, we can't ignore the other. Um, there were payments made to landlords, as I said, in the amount of $644 million. There were issues. This is the first time I know in my lifetime I've seen an eviction moratorium put in place, and there's quite a bit of criticism out there regarding how long those payments took to make it to uh, landlords but I think there are solutions out there um, that allow us to both meet the needs of the landlords while also ensuring we don't more than double homelessness during a time of crisis here in the state Senator Koenig the problem that I see is the moratorium itself was not connected to those payments at all I mean, you had a local government basically saying that you don't have to pay that is equivalent to property theft um, and then you have uh, you have the federal government sure that tried to backfill some of those but there was no connection that means the local government could have uh, essentially stolen uh, that the property the property and um, with with no potential payments and that is totally wrong um, especially if we want ha cheap housing for people um, who's gonna go out there and build cheap housing if so if government's gonna come in and just steal their property I'm not arguing with you that the process certainly could use um, s some some changes in it in order to and be effective. Not, not, not to mention there was huge payments to individuals during the whole COVID crisis that could have been used to pay that rent. You didn't have to have a moratorium on rent. Well, I will respectfully disagree based on the families that we worked with during the pandemic um, who were struggling to stay housed and feed their families. However, we do believe there are measures that can be put into place to, so should we need this type of um, eviction moratorium in the future that could cause it to run um, more seamlessly on both sides. Um, Further questions? Thank you. Are there any other witnesses to testify in opposition to this bill? Are there any witnesses to testify in, for informational purposes only? Seeing none, Senator, do you have any final words? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, your consideration and appreciate the committee's time. You're quite welcome. Uh, next bill coming up, Senator Rader, Senate Bill 768. Whenever you're ready.
Good afternoon, members, Mr. Chairman and members of this committee. I appreciate y'all hearing our bill today and getting this heard so early in session is really exciting to me. So our bill, the um, Veterans Psilocybin Pilot Study Bill, this bill proposes a pilot study and data collection for psilocybin therapy exclusively for Missouri veterans. Now the bill that you have before you is not exclusively for Missouri veterans. We are working on a substitute, but that is one of the changes in it is it's very narrowly made for veterans. i put my glasses on to help myself here. And it's for veterans with quali these qualifying conditions. Um, they must be 21. Um, and have one of these uh, disorders, PTSD, major depressive disorder, substance use disorder, or are in Lent requiring end of life care. The bill restricts psilocybin use to the therapeutic purposes under the supervision of a qualified facilitator. This bill assigns oversight and data collection to the Missouri Department of Mental Health. The filed bill has uh, the Department of um, Social Services, but we are changing, we do have that changed in the committee sub to the Department of Mental Health. The bills are designed to address specific mental health issues in veterans in a therapeutic setting and do not facilitate or endorse recreational use of psilocybin whatsoever. In Missouri, our veterans' suicide rate is notably higher than the national average with 188 veteran suicides reported in 2019. Over 17 million people in the U.S. suffer from major depression, with veterans being significantly affected. U.S. Census data says Missouri has more than 400,000 military veterans. The bill recognizes the unique mental health challenges faced by our veterans, providing an alternative treatment option for treatment-resistant conditions. It acknowledges the troubling reality that veterans, after serving our country and returning home with mental health issues, often have to seek treatment in countries like Mexico and South America. <clears throat> John Hopkins University studies have found that psilocybin treatment leads to significant reductions in depression sy symptoms lasting up to 12 months. In a John Hopkins study, 67% of participants showed more than a 50% reduction in depression symptoms at one week and 71 at four weeks post-treatment. Investing in psilocybin therapy research can potentially reduce long-term health care costs for veterans in Missouri more generally. Current treatments for PTSD are related and related disorders often involve prolonged use of addicting pharmaceuticals, and extensive therapy. Psilocybin therapy could reduce the long-term reliance on healthcare services and medication. And you guys, I don't have to tell y'all, but I do want to state it for those listening that the pharmaceuticals that are used for this often have very troubling side effects and many times are incredibly addicting and then you just have to keep taking more and more. And so this is a natural remedy and with, with really great outcomes. Texas has passed legislation for which this bill is modeled and other states such as Oregon, Arizona, California, Colorado, Hawaii, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Missouri, well, of course, y'all are listening in Missouri, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont, and Washington have also considered or enacted similar measures. This indicates a growing national interest in alternative mental health treatments involving psilocybin. And so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. This bill, the one before you is um, asked for two million. We're actually asking for three for this pilot study. And um, there's also a, a little bit more stricter licensing for the facilitator in the new sub as well. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I know that there are uh, several witnesses that are going to be able to provide um, much more compelling testimony than I. 
Thank you, Senator. This bill sounds like a real trip. <laughs> uh, You've been waiting on give me that. <laughs> Senator Moon. Possibly. I'm not sure if I can follow that one. <laughs> Senator, I didn't look up, but can you tell me what, if any, are the penalties for use of psilocybin uh, currently, if someone is using it on their own? I No, I don't. Okay. I, I know that it's not legal, and this bill in no way makes psilocybin legal. Right. Well, what I'm wondering, though, is that there is reference to uh, no penalties, especially for those who are under 21 or have meet certain conditions. So, so if it's harmless, and that's what I'm reading, that there is harm, uh, minimal, but for the most part, um, and the side effects are minimal as well. So if that's true, why, why should we subject those under 21 and those who are, have those conditions to uh, the possibility of penalties? So it, and, and maybe or maybe not, I'm understanding the question right. It, I, I, would, I would argue that psilocybin can be harmful if too much is is given and so that's why this bill is is very narrow in inside a, a clinical study with a therapist that has been trained in this process so this is not something that anyone is doing on their own i think that it absolutely could, could be harmful in those settings Sure. If done too much. Yeah. I may have some more questions, but we, we can talk afterward perhaps. And, uh, yes. I think I get the gist of it. And, you know, in, in I did find out yesterday that the prosecutors ha might have a, a little bit of a tweak that, they're, that they would like to see that closes something that they're concerned might be a, a backdoor loophole or whatever. And, and I'm absolutely working with them because I, I want them, um, you know, I, I don't want an opening for – you know, yeah, and, outside this study use. And that's where I'm getting uh, to because in that first paragraph uh, in, in the summary it talks about there will be no penalties for those uh, under uh, 21 or who meet the uh, conditions. So I'm just hoping that's not an open door to say, well. We'll fix that if it is. What's that? We'll fix it if it is. We, don't, right. we don't want an open door for in, anyone okay. to be able to use. All right, good, right. We want it inside this clinical study. Further questions? Pilot program. Seeing none, are there any witnesses testify in favor of the bill? Please come forward. <clears throat> How many witnesses are there to testify in favor of? Raise your hand, please. Uh, opposition? Okay. Go ahead and you're ready. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> members of the committee. Um, thank you for taking the time to hear my testimony. My name is Brad Bailey. Uh, I served in the Navy as an operator at SEAL Team 1 from 1995 to 2000. Uh, after a career-ending parachuting accident, uh, I moved into civilian life and started a new career. When the war on terror began, um, I, I was kind of devastated at the number of people coming back, um, suffering from depression and um, most notably suicide. Uh, PTSD became a, an acronym that everybody wanted to find a solution for. Uh, I knew I wanted to get involved and I volunteered at the Navy SEALs Fund. Uh, it's a small charity aimed at helping uh, our community outside of the normal avenues of uh, uh, both the VA and, and <clears throat> other organizations, um, mostly private. Um, several years later, I was asked to take a leadership role as the president of the Navy SEALs Fund. Um, I was very excited to serve my community. Um, what I wasn't really ready for was um, <clears throat> some, of the, uh, some of the soldiers that I had to interact with. Um, one of my responsibilities uh, was first contact with many of these men. Uh, several years, or, I'm sorry, <clears throat> I learned the challenges facing these, you know, once top tier soldiers were diverse, complex, and debilitating. Alcohol, alcoholism and addiction became rampant in our community. Uh, it was used to mass severe depression. Uh, it was not very, uh, it was not uncommon for someone to reach out, get on a path to uh, getting treatment and still end their life. Um, early on, we knew as a community there was something bigger than PTSD, working against our teammates. Uh, TBI became, came to the forefront of our discussion. As an organization and as, as a community, we stopped recommending the VA for treatment and tried to find something else that worked. Um, findings reveal through several studies there's a high propensity for traumatic brain injury among SOF. Uh, and one Army study concluded that one single blast from an explosive door breach can leave a soldier with TBI. 
while training has evolved and practices have changed, uh, in my steel breaching school, we perform six breaches before lunch every day, five days a week. Um, everyday activities in the Special Forces community, let alone the trauma of war, affect our soldiers, their families, our community deeply, deeply for life. Uh, we, be we began hearing uh, successful treatments down in Mexico with psychedelic therapy, so our focus as a community shifted. Initially, we helped arrange travel for several SEALs to receive treatment in Mexico. Uh, the results were staggering. The men utilizing this method of treatment were returning with focus, drive, positivity, enthusiasm. Uh, there were times when I didn't even recognize their voices when they returned. The therapy was actually working. Uh, through the course of arranging travel for dozens of SEALs down to Mexico, we encountered a different issue, which was the need not only for medication, but the need for uh, preparation and, commi and commitment. <clears throat> Understanding who was in an emergent situation versus who could take the time to be educated on the process. Um, it's a very, very important distinction and critical to, uh, to understand when someone is seeking help. For the treatment to be effective, we also need the right system in place to assess and recognize on intake and first contact. It's my strong belief, as well as many other people in our community, that anyone entering this form of therapy must be educated in the process, have intention and purpose, and take the time to prepare. One also needs a strong central support system to be successful post-treatment. Uh, this is not a treatment that covers PTSD or TBI overnight. Uh, you, you must be prepared to do the work and uh, change your life direction and lifestyle. Uh, you also need direction, support, uh, post-therapy. We're learning that TBI can hide for decades. In 2016, I had a, a, an organic ankle transplant. A month later, I had several episodes of total memory loss, and it was told by the VA it was a side effect of the anesthesia. After a CT scan at Duke University, I learned my memory loss was, was not the result of the anesthesia. I had a marble-sized TBI in my frontal lobe. This is the reason so many veterans charities right now today are shifting their mission statements and forming, uh, forming up to keep teammates together. Uh, we feel the need to take care of each other when no one else will. Um, we need psychedelic medical treatments available to veterans here in the United States. It's a tragedy that veterans have to take it upon themselves to create programs for them and their teammates outside of the very organizations tax, tasked with keeping them healthy and safe especially the great state of Missouri that prides itself in championing veterans. The combination of controlled, well-administered psychedelic therapy programs coupled with the desire and commitment of our soldiers to heal can be a life-changing event. This is a path to end veteran suicide. I implore you not only pass this legislation, but ask that you do it with the right mechanisms in place and expeditiously. If you truly want to make a difference and an impact in the veteran community, this is where we start. Thank you, and thank you for your service. Yes, sir. Are there any questions uh, from members of the committee? Well, seeing none. Next witness to testify in favor of, please come forward. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Mark Quinn. I'm a retired command sergeant major serving 42 years in the United States military. And now I serve as the executive vice president of Special Operations Charity Network. I'm here in support of Senate Bill 768 because I've experienced a lot of this personally. I suffered from post-traumatic stress twice in my career. Lucky for me, I had good counseling and good mentoring that got me through it. Unluckily for six soldiers, in my last three commands, they committed suicide because they did not have treatments like these available to them, and I firmly believe that if they did, they'd be alive. And that's not counting the commanding general and the command sergeant major of INSCOM, who I served under, both committed suicide in 2022. That's not good. The 22 a day that everybody talks about is not the right number. It is much higher than that. And it affects veterans, law enforcement, and first responders, in some cases worse, across the United States everywhere. The only, the only thing that I can see is treatment like this being available. And I like to see Missouri take the lead on it. We've got a good program going on down in Washington University right now that mimics multiple programs across the United States. And this, board would, this, this bill would help support that and continue to keep it moving in the right direction and the people that 
that I knew that this happened to it won't happen again. We've got to stop that 22 a day. We've got to reduce it nationwide to nothing. That's what I'm committed to. And that's pretty much it. Thank you for your service. And that number should be zero. Yes, it should. Uh, or the, uh, Senator Moon. Thank you also for your service and your testimony today. You, you mentioned in your particular case, which you were successful at, and that's great, uh, you mentioned counseling. Was there any drug intervention in your particular situation? Um, no. The, the first incident uh, was not very serious. See, I, I think part of the issue is there's a big difference between post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress disorder. If you get to post-traumatic stress before it gets into that disorder level through what the Army has, the, the, the uh, combat care teams, combat mental health teams. Um, in my instance, uh, my chiropractor, believe it or not, was a Northrop Grumman employee, before, engineer before he became a chiropractor, and he witnessed post-traumatic stress within members that, were, that served in Vietnam, so he knew what the symptoms looked like. When I came back from an operation that I was on, and he saw this in me, he knew what it was and took me under his wing and mentored me and put me in a position where I learned how to stay focused. And as Brad discussed, you know, made a decision to make changes in my life. And that helped. Who knows, I might have needed, I might, if this was available, it might have helped shorten the time. The time, it took six months for me to get back on my feet. This incident it put me on my, literally floored me for at least three months. While you were talking, I, a, a memory was triggered, come across some information just this past year that talked about um, the proper counseling, and I think that was imperative in your situation, uh, without drugs. Um, anyway, maybe we can talk some before because, or some at another time, because that's not what this bill is about necessarily. No, not at all. But it, it, but, but it, it works together. It, yes. That counseling, and that's where we come to what this bill does. It narrowly, narrowly brings it under control of the medical community, which you need, mm -hmm. which the counseling will be part of that. Yeah. It won't just be treatment by the psychedelics. There will be counseling involved. There will be, there'll be follow-up. There will be mentoring. It has to be there. And it's good to hear you had success. That's great. Thank oh, you for absolutely. being here today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions for the witness? Seeing none. Next witness to testify in favor of the bill. And I, I'll remind the witnesses too. Please fill out a witness form uh, and leave it on the table before you leave, so we can make sure that your testimony is made into public record. Okay. Uh, good morning. Committee members, um, uh, I'd like to echo, you know, my brothers, uh, uh, Brad and Sergeant Major had said, um, my name is Will Wisner. I'm the executive director of the Grunstall Foundation. I was a career military guy myself. Uh, I am uh, someone I attribute these alternative healing modalities to saving my life. And I have seen it uh, and the impact on uh, many of my brothers and sisters. Uh, I am uh, so convicted to this. In fact, a large portion of the work that we do is specifically in this uh, arena. Uh, in fact, I will be leading a cohort uh, to Columbia end of March uh, again uh, in order to access these life-saving modalities. And I've prepared a, a, a prepared statement here that I'd like to read. And so on behalf of the Grunstall Foundation, it's an honor to address you today uh, concerning Senate Bill 768. Uh, this landmark bill represents a beacon of hope for countless military veterans across our nation, promising to unlock the potential of alternative therapies and treatments, including the ground breaking use of psilocybin. At the Grunt Style Foundation, our mission is to provide support and advocacy for our veterans, those brave men and women who have selflessly served our country, and it is with their well-being in mind that we wholeheartedly support the passage of this bill. The pioneering approach it proposes, especially in utilizing psilocybin, has been recognized by the FDA as a breakthrough therapy since 2018. This distinction underscores the significant potential psilocybin holds in addressing the profound mental health challenges that too many of our veterans face, such as PTSD and depression. The promise of this bill to enhance access to such innovative treatments is not only commendable, but it is necessary. However, while we stand firmly in support of this bill and its objectives, we must also express our concern regarding a specific aspect of its current formulation. Section 2.1 of the Senate Committee Substitute, as written, 
restricts the accessibility of psilocybin therapy exclusively to veterans. While our commitment to veteran welfare is unwavering, we believe the healing should know no boundaries. The imposition of such a restriction overlooks the broader spectrum of individuals who could also benefit from this treatment, including first responders and the spouses of veterans who likewise endure the heavy toll of mental health struggles. No medical breakthrough or therapy should be confined to a select demographic based on profession. Health and healing are universal rights, and when we discover a tool as potent as psilocybin, it is our duty to make it accessible to all who can benefit. This inclusivity not only aligns with the principles of compassion and fairness, but also magnifies the impact of such advancements, extending healing and hope to more of our fellow citizens. While it is the role of government to assure co consumer safety and medical treatments, it is not the role of government to pick and choose which people access those treatments. In essence, while we advocate for the swift passage of Senate Bill 768, we also encourage an amendment to Section 2.1, expanding access to psilocybin therapy beyond vet veterans to include all individuals grappling with severe mental illness and health conditions. Uh, this reflects a commitment to universal well-being and acknowledges the interconnectedness of our struggles <clears throat> pardon me, and our healing. In closing, the Gretzdahl Foundation praises the vision and intent behind Senate Bill 768. It represents a significant step forward in our collective endeavor to support not only our veterans, but all individuals in need of healing. Let us ensure that this bill in its final form embodies the broadest and most inclusive spirit of support, making the promise of psilocybin therapy a reality for all who need it. So thank you for considering our perspective and for your ongoing commitment to the health and well-being of our nation's heroes and our community at large. Thank you, sir. And again, thank you for your service. Are there any questions for the witness? Hmm, seeing none. Next was testifying in favor of. Uh, I want to ask the witnesses if they can uh, limit their testimony to a couple of minutes because we're going to have to wrap this up pretty quick. We've got another hearing starting here at 1 o'clock, so uh, they're going to have to get ready for that. So, And I know we've got several witnesses to go, so whenever you're ready. Thank you for your time and consideration. I'm here in support of Senate Bill 768. My name is Kimberly Kowalski. I'm a former law enforcement officer. I was a detective for the city of St. Louis, your crime capital. I am a former reporter. I am also a forever line of duty death widow. Since the age of one, I've been trained to save somebody and I came to a point where I had to save myself. Jeff spent 20 years, that's my late husband, dying in the line of duty. I had three children, including a foster child that I'd seen abused from an early age. I've had prison training. I've had SEMA training, I've had DEA training, I'd had FBI training, I'd had all kinds of training except for how to save myself. I dropped my daughter off in Seattle, I saw Mary's marijuana shop, and I peeled in there and I thought, I'm going to try one pot caramel to see if I can't recalibrate my brain. If you don't recalibrate your brain, you put yourself at risk for dementia and Alzheimer's. My brain is very high functioning. I needed sleep. It knocked me out for a day and a half. And I can tell you, I came back to St. Louis with a new perspective. I found some, some more people I wanted to save. It was veterans, and I saw so many women being put in the hole by the state of Missouri as a result of drug addiction. Do I believe in the old school way of, of pot and of psilocybin? Yes, I do. You have to ask yourselves, what made the difference between World War II veterans and our veterans coming back from Afghanistan? It was the introduction of a bunch of pharmaceuticals. If you mix that with alcohol, you are pulling a trigger in your brain. You asked the question about how, to the other gentleman about how he helped himself. I went to a uh, weapons of mass destruction bioterrorism a seminar, and I, I can't believe they, they wanted me in there at my advanced age, but I was there, met a man who'd uh, been in counseling for some time. I said, well, I want that guy. I go, I got some serious stuff going on here. So yes, I was in counseling, but if I hadn't had that one moment to recalibrate my brain with something that was old school, that worked for the Vietnam veterans versus all the pill bottles next to me, I don't know exactly what I would be. I know God put me in training from one year of age on. So my spine and my exposure to trauma just kept growing. All right, but some people get exposed to it immediately. The, the first suicide I saw in the line of duty of the only other woman on the other watch, 
That's enough to last me a lifetime. I can tell you the first responders in this state and across this country desperately need in intervention as well. You're dealing with a quasi-military organization. I hope you will understand that I have seen too many people die as a result of suicide or pharmaceuticals mixed with something. If you have the people that are here, your professional that can take you on a small trip and bring you back, I think it's a much better alternative than what we're seeing at 22 plus a day. So I'll end with that, uh, honoring the two minute time. I hope I talked fast enough. <laughs> thank you, thank you for your first service. As a former first responder, I understand what you're talking about real quick. Senator Moon. Dumb it down for me. What, what is recalibrating your brain? It knocked me out, and so what happened was I wasn't able to get a full night's sleep. I was either having bad flashbacks of, of resuscitating my husband during a hurricane, or if my dream cycle would take me back to shootouts on the city's, uh, city streets. So for me to finally shut down, it was like a hard reboot on a computer. That's about the best I could tell you. I turned it all the way down, off. I was hungry when I woke up, I was thirsty. But I've never had to go back and seek that level of intervention. But I came back here with a mission, a new God mission, to make certain that if other people's brains were going so fast that they needed some help, that I offered them something that I had been trained to lock people up for. Thank you, sir. Further questions? Seeing none, uh, next witness to testify in favor of. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having me and giving me this opportunity for this testimony. <clears throat> My name is Alina Robinson. I am a firefighter and EMT at Boone County Fire District, serving the local community in Columbia, Missouri. Psilocybin has saved my life, and I come here to speak from experience. It has been a journey these past two years present here at the Capitol witnessing the progression of breakthrough therapies within our legislation process, and I do support this bill. However, after reading the Senate Bill 768, it was brought to my attention that this bill excludes a population that is currently struggling and desperately needs access to psilocybin as a therapy. This includes first responders, hospital emergency medical staff, health care workers, including the individuals who would be serving these veterans as social workers, therapists, and facilitators, not to mention the underserved, underprivileged populations in our community who are stuck in a cycle of trauma that keeps them in addiction and poverty. It is true that veterans are dedicating their life for freedom and the need to access these therapies immediately, although they fought for all of our freedom, and therefore I do not believe that the state should pick and choose who is worthy of these treatments over other individuals. We should have the freedom for all struggling individuals to seek help through alternative therapies as long as it's safe for them to do so without exclusion. As a first responder, I can tell you that many of my colleagues are veterans who continue to serve our communities after they have been discharged from the military but also so many of us are not. Yet we choose to serve our country on the front lines in a different way every day. I am here on behalf of the first responder community to speak on a very real struggle that first responders encounter day in and day out with little effective means to treat these common issues at hand. These issues include difficulty concentrating, feeling overwhelmed, mood changes, chronic agitation, irritability, cluster headaches, obsessive compulsive behavior, trauma and PTSD, feeling of futility, burnout, compassion fatigue, and, addi and addiction. Psilocybin ther therapy can help with all of these issues, especially depression and PTSD. Meta-analysis of 32 studies that were published from 1985 to, th to 2021 stated, quote, PTSD prevalence rates reaching 57% for firefighters and 37.8% for active military personnel. First responders are a vulnerable population high, at higher risk for mental health conditions that are five times more likely to experience depression and PTSD than a normal population. 
Constant traumatic exposure leads to compact stress, which over time can cause individuals to have suicidal ideation. Suicide rates among first responders is one of the highest and currently rising. Many of my colleagues are reluctant to speak up about their struggles and fear of losing their jobs. Psilocybin therapy can radically improve population that is in need of our help in a real mental health crisis. Aside from the first responders, think about the healthcare workers, especially during the 2020 pandemic that endured trauma. Think about the first responders who serve that many don't realize a good portion of our traumas come from serving and being a witness to the underprivileged and underserved communities and everyone else in between who are currently struggling with their mental health. I also want to mention how DEA has made it legal for people to purchase spores and people go out of their own way to treat their mental health illnesses by themselves, which raises a lot of risk that can be mitigated with access to these therapies. So today I hope that the Senate committee can hear my words and trust that it can resonate deep within your hearts. I hope that this bill will be revised to include the people of our community who often go unnoticed, but who continue to serve the community no matter the cost thank you thank you thank you for your service any questions for the witness seeing none any other witnesses testify in favor of the bill please come forward hi hey thank you to the committee thank you to the bill sponsor my name is ann bethune i'm a licensed clinical social worker from kansas city missouri my business is kap kansas city which is ketamine assisted psychotherapy and Midwest psychedelic training. I want to speak to the proposed requirements in this bill for those facilitating psilocybin therapy. By specifying licensed, trained, and credentialed medical and medical mental health professionals, this bill sets a very high standard for safety and efficacy. All the professional categories mentioned in this bill have at least a master's level education in direct clinical training. I contrast that with the Oregon bill. The Oregon facilitation requirements are 21 years old, resident of the state, high school diploma, and take a 120 hour course. 36 of those hours are non-clinical content. The Missouri bill puts this treatment out of the unsafe, unregulated underground into the purview of trained professionals. Psilocybin treatment, while safe and effective, does have some diagnostic rule outs. It's not for everybody. There are um, people who may be in heightened emotional states. You need support and preparation before, during, and after the experience. Integration of the medicine experience after the dosing session is what makes the benefits of the experience durable. Psychedelic integra integration is an individualized intervention that helps a person make meaning of the experience for shifts in thoughts and behaviors. It helps them go through their experience in, in how, and see how it can lead to transformation. The Missouri bill calls for facilitators be, to be trained in integration. This bill tracks training for facilitation to the American Psychological Association guidelines for psychedelic assisted therapy. The APA is the leading professional scientific research organization governing psych uh, psychology. There is a significant body of research establishing the safety of psilocybin and its trans diagnostic qualities, meaning that this medicine can treat a number of mental health presentations, including the four named in the bill. The amount of psilocybin allowed in SB 768 is modest. It's enough for two or three doses over a 12 month period. So that restriction will safeguard against diversion or misuse of the medicine. Across the country, it's the mental health crisis that's driving research, education, investment, and interest in psilocybin and other psychedelics. Missouri is responding with a bill to get this medicine out of the shadows with unqualified providers and respond to a mental health crisis with a safe therapeutic infrastructure. Thank you. I'll take questions. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions for the witness? Seeing none. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any witnesses testify in favor of the bill? Any witnesses to testify in opposition to the bill for informational purposes only? Seeing none, Senator Rader, do you have any final thoughts 
that you can share with us? I do, and I appreciate again that y'all hearing this bill so early. I too would love for it to be open to everyone. You know, you guys know the work that I've done in, with substance use disorder for a decade now, and and I know that this is something that's going to help that. And um, the reason that we have have narrowed this down to veterans is because of the pushback from the House members that shut it down last year and killed the bill at the last minute. And so in, in order to keep that from happening, I had several members tell me that they would sit down and, and just quietly vote no and not try to kill it this year if we did just narrowly tailor it to veterans. My hope is is that once we see, once we do the study and we see that it's certainly successful and we have Missouri data, there's data all over the U.S. right now on, on the the wonderful outcomes of psilocybin, um, that once we have a Missouri study that we could then open it up and move forward with this being a treatment as, as um, the previous witness just said and, and moving this out of the shadows because it is a, a, it should be something that is used often in, 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 the, in the stead of pharmaceuticals in my opinion. So. Um, Thank you so much, and we'll be sure to get um, the finished committee sub with the three million instead of the two, and the change of the departments, et cetera, to you um, by the end of the day. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Maybe if you get us some free samples, the Senate might function a little better. <laughs> no other uh, business coming forward. The committee emerging issues. We're adjourned. <laughs>